Well, hey everybody, my name's Aaron. Welcome back to the channel. Well, as you can see, I'm not in my garage today at the Retro Hack Shack. I'm actually in Silicon Valley at the Computer History Museum attending VCF West. So what I thought I'd do is take the camera inside and see what I can find. Maybe some cool old computers, maybe some interesting projects or interesting personalities. That's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. The Vintage Computer Festival West, or VCF West 2023, took place on August 4th and 5th this year. The Computer History Museum is an obvious great venue for this event, and it's basically divided up into three areas, an exhibit area, a speaker area, and a consignment area where you can buy and sell things. This is the first time I've attended this event because there's usually some sort of summer activity going on, and then there was the whole human malware thing that seems to be still hanging around around unfortunately, but I will tell you right now, I had a blast at this event. It certainly gives you an opportunity to see some things you don't see every day. There were more Commodore SX-64 set up here than I've ever seen in my life. Likewise, there were plenty of classic Macs for people to play around with and relive their childhoods or introduce their own children for the first time. There was also a great collection of older systems. Here's a display of S100 bus systems. Here's a MSI 8080 and a Victor 1, which I hadn't heard of before, but check out all those LEDs on it. Ooh, blinky. Here's a game system called the Studio 2, and here's an early kit computer called the Elf. If you watched my Apple One series, you'll recognize this over here. Two clones on display. I really need to make a display case for mine. There were tons of exhibits and people to talk to. A local library showed up and took advantage of the opportunity to sell some vintage books and other materials that had been donated to the library, but really only appeal to an audience like this. I saw this case out of the corner of my eye and was immediately drawn to it. It's the same case as the lunchbox PC I looked at in a previous episode. I mentioned in the video that this case was used by a lot of OEMs looking to make their mark in the portable PC market. But this time, it was not a PC in the case, but a Macintosh. It's called the Colby Lap Mac. So I guess we can add one more vendor to the list. I also ran into quite a few fellow YouTubers while I was there. Here's the Mac librarian who made the trek all the way to California for the event. I'm not sure if I would want to do a dedicated exhibit for my channel, because I was having way too much fun looking at all the projects and talking to people. Speaking of which, I ran into Jerry Ellsworth while I was there, and she was nice enough to talk to me for a few minutes, even though I apparently couldn't frame my camera correctly, so sorry about that. Hey everybody, I look who I ran into, it's Jerry Ellsworth, legendary uh, persona in the retro community, the VR community, the AR community, uh, at least to me anyway, so really glad to run into her. Uh, what are you doing here? Oh, just nerding out with uh, fellow like-minded people, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I felt the same way, I'm having all of these conversations with people and just like, oh that's so cool, how did you do that? And then they explain it and it's just like mind blown, right? I absolutely love um, running into the old timers that were there back in the early days before like doing a lot of this stuff was easy to do. They yeah. really, their uh, skill was like, I, I can't even describe what they went through to make some of these machines. Right, with, yeah. the, with the resources they had and how expensive things like memory were and just, you know, yeah. you don't get the sock that you can easily like, you know, tiny little sock you can easily put on a board. You had to do it with discrete logic tips and, and all of that. So yeah, it's really amazing. Yeah, so what are you what are you doing here today? You're actually here to talk about your, your company, right? And your product. A little bit, oh. yeah, yeah. So um, yesterday I did a presentation, kind of my history, how I was a super nerdy kid, the one picked on in school, and then I had this like turnaround in my life where I became like all, uh, you know, gothy and, and me. <laughs> And then, <laughs> then turned my I life can't around again. That. Come on. Yeah, and then I turned my life around again. Got into race cars, and then owned a chain of computer stores in the '90s. And then I uh, started working with Silicon Valley startups, which ultimately led to the current startup that I uh, yeah. founded, where we're doing augmented reality glasses.
glasses or group gaming. So you sit around the table, you wear these lightweight glasses and video game characters pop up out of the, the surface and you can directly interact with them, you know, action games, puzzle games, you know, and, and around the office, uh, it's like a museum in our office. I make sure that all of our team understand what worked in the past and didn't work um, in the past because it all applies today too. Such and important lessons. And a lot of times it's what you leave out of a product that makes it great. Right. Like right. in my Atari, we have a dedicated Atari room, nice. one of the conference rooms. Nice. It's a kind of Atari age, but I have right next to Atari VCS, I have the Fairchild Channel F. And so if you look at the specs of the Fairchild Channel F, it was just technically a better machine. But, you know, uh, like I, I was uh, listening to uh, DeCure yeah. yesterday, and he said, yeah, yeah he, he described this perfectly. He said, Atari was an entertainment company that just happened to know electronics. Fairchild was a chip company that knew engineering. And that was the difference, even though they were technically better than Atari. Right, right. And it was a real risk for Fairchild. It sounds like we could go on and on. I don't want to take too much time. No, it's it was a fine. real risk for them, right? Because they actually acquired that product from another company. Yeah. Initially, at least the prototype, and then decided to productize it. And then eventually said, nah, this isn't for us. It's not successful enough. And, you know, little did they know if they had maybe stuck it out a little bit longer, or made a, a few more innovations in their products. You should come by our office. We could go through these different rooms. There's so many, like, interesting parallels that um, you can draw. Like, in that same room, I have RCA, yeah. Magnavox, yeah. Mattel, you know, uh, Bally. And it's like, who who figured it out and cracked the code? Atari. A couple right. guys in Santa Clara in a jank, janky little building figured out the magic of a relatable, fun game. A right place, right time. Yeah. 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 So I was actually able to see, a, I don't know if it was an early prototype. This was a t long time ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. You were saying earlier when way up at, uh, in Twitter. Petaluma. In Twitter. Petaluma. Yeah. 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 That and, was sticks and stones back oh, then. But I was blown away. I couldn't believe it then. So, yeah, I'm actually really... Really anxious to check it out. Come everybody on by, should. try it out. It's for so, sale. You can get it now. Go buy it. Highly recommend it. It is amazing. But Jerry, thank you so much for talking today. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And have a great conference. Woo! If there's one thing those old timers would have appreciated, it's fast inexpensive prototype PCBs. And that brings us to the sponsor of today's episode, PCB Way. PCBWay offers inexpensive PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. Need assembly services? No problem. They can do front side, back side, through hole components, you name it. They also offer 3D printing, CNC milling, and more. So check out PCBWay for your next project, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Hey everybody, I'm here with Mike and he has some really cool projects I want to show you. Uh, you may have seen these before. I've seen them floating around the internet, but never in person. And let me tell you, they are super interesting. So the first one is this setup you have here with live video on a Commodore PET. That's, That's amazing. Right, yeah. How so, does this work? So yeah, this is a project I call Pet Picks. And uh, basically I have, a, I have a Raspberry Pi interface to the 8-bit user port on the back of the PET. And uh, the, the Raspberry Pi is acting as a web server, so I'm capturing video from a phone camera, and then I'm doing conversion in JavaScript, where I chop up the each image in the video to eight pixel by eight pixel blocks. And ends up. Yeah. We spent all this time getting it set up. Yeah. Of course, as soon as we yeah, start of rolling, it's inevitable. Yeah. They, uh, they make an announcement. <laughs> yeah. So the the phone is basically converting a frame of video into a collection of Petsky characters, and those get sent over to the Raspberry Pi. The pet itself is running a small piece of software which reads from the user port as fast as possible and it writes those bytes straight into video memory and it shows up here on the pet screen. So we have live video showing up on the pet. And uh, yeah, on the, on the 40 column pet, you end up getting, you can get around 40-ish frames per second. Wow. 80 column, it's uh, about 24 frames per second. And uh, yeah, it's a fun project I've been messing around with for a few years now. So Nice. Well, it looks really good and it is really responsive. I mean, when you wave your hand or, or look at the display, I mean, it's changing, all, Yeah, I mean, to my eye anyway, yeah, yeah. almost in real time. That is so cool. Yeah, the latency is not, to, not that long and definitely seems... Uh, 
It looks like video. Now right. tell me about the Romulator too, because I've seen sure. this before as well. So yeah, this is a board called the Romulator, and this is uh, a RAM and ROM replacement device for 6502 processors. I also have a Z80 version of it. But basically it implements a whole memory system for a computer with a 6502. So you can you can uh, take out your 6502, pop this in the CPU slot, socket, and then uh, you can replace your entire memory system if you want. And you can also select only regions of the memory system to replace. So a specific ROM went bad or something like that, you can do that. So and, yeah, so where can people go to find out more information about these projects? Uh, you can go to my website, bitfixer.com, or uh, YouTube channel, bitfixer, as well. And uh, yeah, so I make that. I also make the Pet Disk Max, which is the uh, SD card, SD card uh, emulator for the Commodore Pet as well. Nice. Or drive emulator that is. But uh, yeah, some some of the projects that awesome. I work on. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I yeah, absolutely. It. Thank All you right. very much. Hey everybody, I'm here with Steve. He's going to tell me what's going on with this BBC Micro. Okay, so this is a BBC Micro, a Model B, uh, which was one of the original BBC Micro range from Acorn. This is hooked up to uh, a BBC buggy, which we got over here. Um, and what we can do is, using the test program here, uh, we can do a lot of different things with this, but we, using the test program, we can just manually uh, maneuver the buggy around and check everything's working. The buggy not only has the capability of movement, but it's got basic sensors as well. So if we go to number four for the sensor test, you can see that we've got the LDR there. And uh, if you just hold your hand over the front of the LDR, we'll see the number changing. And also, in terms of the barcode sensor, we can use that for testing, kind of sensing light and dark and doing line following type activities. The way that this works is uh, the BBC buggy is connected to digital outputs uh, from the B using its user port interface that goes out from underneath uh, through this buffer card into the top where there are some um, uh, stepper motor drivers. Um, but the nice thing about the BBC, it has a lot of I.O. capabilities. It's also got some analog input ports, so it makes use of that for things like the light sensor and the barcode reader. They're fed in, again, through the interface card into the analog port in the back. That's um, awesome. Now, I know that uh, Apple also had their logo yeah. project with the turtle thing, I think, that would move around, right? I mean, yep. is, that, is this kind of similar to that? Or? It, it is very similar, actually. So the BBC buggy, you can control using logo. There was an Acorn implementation of that, Acorn soft logo. Comes with drivers for not only the BBC buggy, but also uh, the Jessup Ralph turtle which is the one that you're probably more likely recognize right. associated with uh, Apple IIs uh, and many other turtles as well. There were quite a few that were developed in, in the UK kind of uh, back in the 1980s. Um, and surprisingly, quite a few folks have said they've seen these over here in the US. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Yeah, I certainly kind of associated it with that when I first saw it. And I also noticed you're using, uh, you know, some good uh, retro upgrades to the system <laughs> yeah. here. You got a GoTech. It's yep. kind of standard uh, uh, issue, I think, for anybody that's into vintage computers. And the RGB to HDMI that I saw on my site. That's so cool. Yeah, the, these are absolutely great. It was originally developed for the Acorn BBC range, but uh, folks quickly realized we couldn't use it with a whole host of other machines. I have like five or six of these uh, I use with different machines. It's absolutely great because you get pixel perfect scaling of the original uh, original image and, and no noise. Um, and of course, it's much easier to go to events like this uh, with an LCD panel than it is to lug around CRTs I was just on the kind of bum that. bumpy roads of California. Yes, definitely, definitely, much easier. Right, well, thank you very much for showing us around. That's awesome. You're very welcome, thank you. The sessions at the event were really good too. I was lucky enough to drop in on part of Al Alcorn's talk on the early days of Atari. If you've never heard him talk about the early days of Atari, I would highly recommend it. For example, here is the gun story, which is kind of famous. And we introduced ourselves and the guy says, oh, you're with Atari. And he says, you know, you're operating in my territory. And he reaches in his pocket and pulls out a pistol. 
puts it on the table and says, and I said, well, we'll stop that right away, you know. <laughs> anyway, the next day I went back to work. I said, oh, pull the gun on me. Christ's sake. Oh, he's just kidding. You, I'm not doing this anymore. You do that. I'll stick to the engineering. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The consignment area had some interesting stuff to buy, but by the time I got there, it was mostly gone. I did pick up some old Commodore 64 power supplies though, so I can rebuild them with new components so they don't kill any Commodores in the future. I did a video on how I do that if you want to check it out. All in all, I had a great time, and I was even able to snap some selfies of me with some of my heroes while I was there. If you haven't been to a VCF conference yet, you really should check one out soon. I understand that they're adding one in the LA area for next year, so if you live near LA, consider attending or maybe even volunteering for that event early next year. I want to thank all my patrons for their support. If you want to get early access and ad-free access to all of my videos and help support the channel, you can check out my Patreon page at the link on the video. Also, if you're interested in other events that I think are pretty cool, you should check out this one about an event with every arcade and pinball game you could ever want to play, and I'll see you over there in that video. End of line.